Hi, Greg Anderjeski, Director of Research and Development at Gilmore. I just wanted to talk for a moment about some of the challenges we face when recovering from smaller flash-based storage, like USB thumbsticks and SD memory cards. So I guess we'll start by um, cracking open your typical USB thumbstick. And you'll see there's really not a whole lot to these things. So on this side of the circuit board, we've got this chip right here, which is called the controller. And he's the brains of the operation. His responsibilities include um, communicating with the host PC, um, remembering where things are stored on the flash memory chip, and basically doing the uh, backflips to make this device behave like a disk drive that Windows and OS X are used to talking to. So on the other side of the device, we've got a NAND flash memory chip right here. And this chip actually um, confine, or conforms to an industry standard pinout, which basically means each one of these 48 pins, uh, the assignment as to which signal that pin carries, and then the interface as to how you communicate with the NAND flash memory doesn't change from chip to chip. So this is good for manufacturers because you don't have to completely redesign the board to say go from a four gigabyte thumbstick to an eight gigabyte thumbstick. Um, but it really is an also um, good for recovery because what we can do is we can remove this NAND flash memory chip from the board should the device fail and uh, pop it in a device programmer and actually get a full dump of the contents of that memory um, really without a whole lot of trouble. Um, now that's the easy part of NAND flash recovery because what we see from this NAND flash memory chip um, is a lot different than what your computer sees when you plug this thing into the USB port. Again, the controller has to do a lot of work to, again, make this device behave like a disk drive that Windows is used to communicating with. Um, and it does a pretty good job of that. Um, but again, we have to replicate all of that and all of that behavior um, when we're going to be recovering directly from the memory. All right, let's take a look at another seemingly identical drive, uh, same manufacturer, same capacity, probably even sold under the same SKU at retail. Uh, once you get this guy open, it's kind of like opening an NES cart, a lot of empty space in there. Um, and so what this guy is, once you get him out of the USB enclosure, the data recovery industry, we call this a monolith or a monolithic USB flash drive. Um, basically, it appears to be all one chip. And so the first time we saw these types of devices come in for recovery and they didn't work, uh, we kind of just said, well, you know, it's one chip. When that one chip doesn't work, you know, there's much you can do. Sort of like, you know, if this NAND flash memory chip itself were damaged, um, you know, there's really nothing to recover from. But as we dug a little deeper, um, and looking at one of these monolithic USB flash drives under X-ray, you can see that they're really not all that different. Um, you can clearly see a controller uh, buried within the packaging and also even a NAND flash memory chip um, probably, you know, for all intents and purposes, identical uh, to what's found on their more discrete cousins here. The problem is, well, how do you recover from this device if we can't get at uh, the NAND flash memory chip? So we started poking around a little more and we noticed a strange pattern on the bottom of the device. Uh, you can kind of see here, it looks like a 6x6 BGA or ball grid array pattern like you find under um, you know, some forms of memory chips. And uh, the fact that you don't have direct access to the memory anymore uh, may come into uh, play during manufacturing as well. You know, for example, if the manufacturer needed to uh, flash or apply some base firmware image or some initial starting piece of data on the memory, uh, they can't do that anymore if the memory chip is integrated into this package. Uh, so our initial thoughts were, you know, maybe these pads or these um, connections on the underside of the device actually lead directly to the NAND flash memory. Uh, the problem is that 6x6 array is not an industry standard. Even though they may, can't, may, even though they may carry the same signals, uh, they don't have the same assignments, and uh, you know, a lot of times the manufacturer isn't going to disclose or may not even know what the assignments are for those pins. So. Uh, to find out, we have to do a little bit of reverse engineering, so uh, the first part of that involves digging out our logic analyzer. Alright, so what I've done here is uh, acquired a monolithic USB flash drive, the exact same kind uh, as the one that came in for recovery, and basically soldered a very tiny wire to a little pin header here so that we can hook up a logic analyzer and see exactly what's going on at each test point. Uh, during the device's normal operation. So by watching um, the signals that are being transmitted uh, theoretically to and from the controller on this device, we should be able to determine um, which corresponds to which NAND flash signal. 
and then we can attach to our failed device and actually get raw direct access to the memory just like we do with a device made of discrete components. So let's hook up the logic analyzer right now and see exactly uh, what we can. Okay, so we've got our logic analyzer attached. And uh, before we go any further, I just want to recognize the wave of anxiety that's passing over me right now. Uh, imagine you just spent the last couple hours soldering these really tiny wires to these really tiny pads. And all the time in the back of your mind, you're wondering, did I kill this device when I remove the solder mask? Am I using too much heat? Uh, is this thing still going to work when I plug it in? Because if it doesn't, all that work is for nothing. So deep breath. Let's plug the drive in. Got new hardware. And we've got our USB drive. So we're exactly where we need to be right now. We've got a fully functioning monolithic USB drive with a logic analyzer attached so we can exactly see the signals that are passing uh, hopefully to and from the controller and the memory chip. And then we can use uh, the pattern of this electrical signals to determine which uh, pad corresponds to which signal. So Let's get something uh, happening here. Let's move this 300 megabyte ISO file onto the flash drive. And while that's going, I'm going to tell the software that runs my logic analyzer, take a snapshot of exactly what's happening right now. All right, so things are already starting to come together. Um, you can see these eight signals here up at the top. They're really constantly varying. There really doesn't seem to be a whole lot of rhyme or reason. Um, to the information that they're sending right now. So those are probably the data lines. Most NAND flash memory um, is 8 bits wide, meaning it transfers 8 bits or 1 byte of data per transaction. And this kind of peer, this fairly periodic signal down here uh, suggests to me either the read or write enable line. So every orchestra needs a conductor, basically somebody in charge saying, okay, you know those eight data lines? The next byte you need to read is ready now, is ready now, is ready now. So this kind of fairly periodic signal we're seeing right here is probably keeping things in sync with the data that's being, that it's, that's being transferred. Um, so just kind of using this general behavior is going to allow us to go ahead and map the rest of the control signals. So not the signals that actually transfer the data, but the signals that are used to set up the transfer. Basically explain which part of the memory you want to read, uh, check when the NAND is ready to transfer, and then finally pull the trigger. So we'll go ahead and we can map the rest of those, and then we need to get to the portion where we actually figure out which data line corresponds to which bit in the byte. So the last task we've got is to map each of the eight data lines to their corresponding pad on the underside of the flash drive. Now to do that, I'm going to play a bit of a hunch. I'm going to bet that the controller, one of the first thing it does after being plugged in, is load its firmware from the NAND flash memory. Now firmware is the software that runs the drive itself. It's kind of like the operating system of the flash drive. And the controller needs to load this before it can allow access to any of the data. So one of the first commands the controller is probably going to issue is a read command to an area of the flash memory where its firmware lives. Now we're lucky because the command code for a read command is all zeros. So it doesn't matter if we don't know the order of the data lines. As long as we've identified them, we can set up our logic analyzer to trigger, take a snapshot when a command is issued with all data lines being zero. So let's go ahead and set that up right now. And anyone that's spent any sort of time with the NAND flash specification will recognize these signals here. I uh, will say when the drive is ready, we're looking for a command. Trigger on the rising edge of right enable. So we'll use chip enable one asserted. So I'm going to press play so the logic analyzer is waiting for that event to occur. And I'm going to go ahead and plug our flash drive in. Okay, so just as we predicted, it looks like a read command is being issued here. So this is the read command itself being issued, and then this is the location of the memory it wants to read. So it looks like it's reading the very front of the memory. As we scroll forward in time, you see the ready busy line change from busy, where, hey, I'm executing your command, to ready. I'm done. And this is probably a read cache command, or an actual command that sets up the transfer. And then actually, um, here we go with the data being transferred. 
So this at first glance doesn't do us a whole lot of good. We still don't know uh, exactly what the data is supposed to look like that's being transferred, but we've already got a couple things working in our favor here. We've already determined that the controller inside this model of the USB flash drive um, is a Fizon PS2251. And the Fizon PS2251 has a very easily recognizable firmware signature. It's a basically an integrity check that the controller uses to make sure what it's reading actually is firmware. The firmware always begins with the ASCII characters BT Pram CD or an app or in hex 42, 74, 50, 72, 61, 60, 43, 64. Now there's another wrinkle involved right here. The FISA PS2251 also usually puts the data through an XOR cipher before writing it to the memory chip. It kind of scrambles it to get a more even distribution of ones and zeros. So the bytes that we're actually looking for coming back are B8, EA, D0, 11, B3, 5A, B3, 90. Let's take a look at what we have here. So what we're looking at here is the beginning of the data transfer for the first read command issued by the NAND flash controller. The first byte we're expecting to be transferred is B8. So breaking that down into the corresponding bit values, um, produce 10111000. And as we recall from before, read enable defines when the next bit is ready to be read from the data bus. So the first byte that the controller would read is right here. So let's just take a look at this signal right here. This is a value of one. So the controller would read a bit value of one for that data line, which means for the first byte value that this data line could correspond to bit seven, bit five, bit four, or bit three. Let's move on to the second byte that should be transferred, EA, which has a bit pattern of 11101010. Looking at our logic analyzer, we notice that our signal changes from a 1 to a 0. There's only one bit position that changes from a 1 to a 0 between these two bytes, and it's bit 4. So I can say with a certain degree of confidence that that data line corresponds to data bit 4. By applying these same methods, we can put the data lines in the correct order based on the data that pattern of data that we're seeing through each successive byte being transferred. Okay, so I've grouped the data lines in the order in which we're proposing, and so let's take a look at the actual bytes now that are being transferred from the memory. So the first byte that the controller is reading back is B8, seems to match. Moving on to the second byte, EA, D0, 1, 1, B3, etc. It looks like our hunch paid off and we've successfully mapped all eight of the data lines to their corresponding pads on the underside of the monolithic USB flash drive. So now we've got all the information we need to wire up our customer USB flash drive to a breakup board like this, which we can then attach to a device programmer to read the raw NAND flash memory in much the same fashion as if we pulled off a discrete memory chip from a circuit board. So hopefully this gives you an idea as to the kind of efforts that are involved in some USB flash drive recoveries. Until next time, I'm Greg Energeski. Thanks for watching.